Hi. <laughs> so, welcome to my talk, How to Pack Your Webpack. So, I'm Johannes, uh, this is my Twitter handle. Um, I will post the slides afterwards. And so I founded a, co a company with my friends in Germany. It's called Pyrigon, and I also work in the Webpack core team. So I'm going to show you how I, am, I would configure my Webpack setup. I want to give you a, a walkthrough. And our example app is going to use React and TypeScript. And I hope you can apply this, the, uh, my tips to your specific project setup. So step one, create the config. <laughs> so we're going to create the Webpack config TS. Oh, wait, what? That's right, you can use TypeScript in your Webpack config. That's really nice. So all you have to do is to use the, the TS file extension, install TypeScript, and install the types for Webpack, and TS node, which is required to execute TypeScript with node. And then add this to your TS config. You probably already have it because everyone who's using ECMAScript modules in TypeScript needs to add this compiler, these compiler options, but just to make sure. And in your Webpack config, we create a variable using the Webpack configuration type, like this. And now we're going to profit from this. So uh, it will give you a nice intelligence. So if you don't remember what the output uh, path thingy was, you just type P and it will show you all the uh, possibilities. And it even is able to correct you if you configured it in a wrong way. It cannot detect all the errors, but at least some of them. Step two, now we turn that configuration into a function. So we have this config and we wrap it in a function. So now we have a function that returns a Webpack configuration. Why have we done that? So step three, make the mode configurable. So once we have a function, we can pass in arguments from the Webpack CLI. So we pass in the env, we destructure it, we pull out the mode from the env and pass it to the configuration. And we also apply defaults, like in this case, I'm going to default to production if I don't specify any environment. So what are these modes? Webpack has three different modes to uh, enable default configurations, and we've added it in Webpack 4 to make uh, working with Webpack easier. So in development, there are no bundle optimizations, such as minification and tree shaking, but we have the full developer tool support. Uh, process env, node env is set to development, and that switches a lot of libraries, for instance, like React, into development mode, where they show you nice, nicer errors. We also have the production mode, where all the bundle optimizations are enabled, and there is no developer tool support by default, and node env is set to production, and we also have none, which you barely need to use. I only use it for debugging any Webpack-specific problems, but I don't, I doubt you will, you will need it. So the mode applies defaults, but you can uh, always override them. But honestly, the default configuration is often good enough for a lot of applications. So please only override the defaults if you know what you're doing. So now we can add two scripts to our, web, uh, to our package JSON. One is the build script, that's for our production build. We don't pass in any env, so it will default to production. And the dev uh, script will start Webpack in development mode. Step four, set your entry. So an entry in Webpack is, it points to the module where Webpack is going to build its module graph and Webpack will figure out all dependencies that this entry point de uh, depends on. So we add the entry like this. And I'm always using require resolve here because uh, I like to have like early errors if, 
if the file is not there or um, I also like absolute, absolute paths because relative paths are sometimes are scary. <laughs> so step five, we set the output. The output in Webpack is uh, where it controls where Webpack will write all the assets to. And it also allows to configure file names and such. So we could specify the path where Webpack is going to write the files, but uh, in this case, so we use dist, but in this case we can just leave it out because Webpack has already uh, the default dist, and I think it's, it's rather reasonable to have dist. I like it. Now I'm creating a variable to, to uh, a Boolean variable to store uh, in which kind of mode we are, so is dev. And we can switch when you're in dev mode, we just want uh, the name of the chunk.js. So we get main.js, for example, or uh, post.js or whatever. And in production, we use the content hash um, of the JS file and we configure it like this. So in development, we have these files, and in production, we have nice hashed files that we can cache a little bit longer. Step six, set up a bail loader. Wait, isn't this a TypeScript project? I said it's going to be TypeScript, so are we supposed to use the TS loader then? Well, you can, but honestly, Babel preset TypeScript works also pretty good. There are some caveats. For instance, it doesn't work with const enums, and there are minor differences, but personally, I never came across those, and I think they're like more if you're using, uh, yeah, uh, older or uh, not so common features in TypeScript. So for me, it worked quite well. Uh, but Babel preset TypeScript doesn't do any type checks. It just removes the type information. No type checks. Isn't that the point of using TypeScript? It is, but I'm going to ask you, do we need to check the types during the Webpack build? And I'm also going to ask you, do we need to lint our code during the Webpack build? So now I'm going to do a short excursus on how to speed, your, uh, speed up your Webpack build. And I'm going to tell you the secret to make it really fast. Do less. <laughs> Thanks for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> so I was once in a project where we had a, a Webpack build that lasts for 40 seconds. And we removed the ease lint loader and dropped down to 12 seconds. And I asked them, do, do we need the ESLint loader in our Webpack build? No, I don't know who added that. And uh, I want you to question that. If you're using the ESLint loader in your Webpack build, do you really need it? So my personal opinion is IDEs should show type and linting errors. It should always be possible to create a development build despite of type and linting errors. And I think types and linting should be checked and enforced during post-test. So we still have, of course, enforce uh, everything, but as a test step, not during development. And this speed up, speeds up the uh, development build. So now we're going to configure the Babel loader. We add the test, so we only want to run the Babel loader on TSX files. We pass in options, and I'm going to use the uh, Babel preset TypeScript and Babel preset React to transpile JSX. Okay, how does BW Webpack build now for real? <laughs> so this is one uh, one little trick that everyone uh, is looking for. This little switch to make it faster, and you should use cache directory true in the Babel loader if you're using the Babel loader, of course, because that will instruct the Babel loader to uh, cache um, uh, like uh, steps in between on the file system, and when you do the build again, it will reuse all uh, the transpiled modules. 
And I'm also going to use the include, like this, the include um, condition. So we only want to use the babel loader inside the source directory. And this is also really, really uh, important because uh, if Babel is going to transpile all your node modules, your Webpack build is going to be really, really slow. So you should take care that Babel is only transpiling the necessary files. So my tip is use test for file extensions and use include for directories and absolute paths. And the nice thing is if you're using include for for absolute or for the paths and directories, you can also add additional modules that require transpilation because they have maybe a, like a they only support modern browsers and you need to support old browsers. So you can still add them later, but we don't transpile just everything in node modules. Step seven: set up Babel preset env and we're also going to use a browsers list. So our goal is that we want a single place for configuring our target browsers. And all other tools should use that configuration. And of course, we also only want to include the necessary polyfills. Uh, so don't just put every polyfills in because that's going to make a bundle really, really huge. Only include the necessary things. So I'm going to add Babel preset env to my Babel presets. I'm going to switch off modules. I'm not sure if that's really necessary, but I just want to make sure. So this, uh, this uh, instructs Babel preset env to not translate modules because uh, Webpack is going to need all the module information. So we want to make sure that uh, Webpack is going to see ECMAScript modules. And we use the use built-ins usage option, which tells uh, Babel that uh, only to include the polyfills that we actually need. And I think it's a heuristic. I'm not sure if it's 100% correct, but for me, it, it worked really well. But you, of course, you always have to test on, uh, on the actual browsers if it works. So there, there might be some obscure cases where it doesn't work. Okay, so let's create this browsers list RC and please make sure that you spell browsers list because <laughs> once in a project I just wrote browser list RC and I wanted, oh, it's not working and I, I saw, oh, there's an S missing, so make sure it's, uh, it has the correct name. And it should be in your project route where the package JSON is. So a browsers list RC specifies all browser versions that need to be supported and there, it is recognized by a lot of tools such as Babel and PostCSS. And it's basically a text file that contains a so-called browsers list query. So in this case, we say uh, we only want to support the last two versions of all the popular browsers. We exclude some of the browsers that are not supported anymore, but we somehow have to support IE9. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I hope you don't have to. <clears throat> Okay, so that's nice for production builds, but do we really want to do that in development builds as well? And remember, do less. We want to transpile less in development because we want to do less. So we don't want to do that in development builds. When we have this browser list RC, we can add environments. So we say this is our production configuration. For production, we need to transpile a lot more, but in development, we we just use the latest browsers. And of course, you can add all the browsers that your team is using, Edge, Safari, whatever. And this will, uh, this will tell Babel to only transpile the necessary things. And I also said, the, uh, to make it work, we need to set the browsers list env, and you also need to set the Babel env to either development or production. Um, this is kind of hacky, but uh, it works and I, I like it. So you put that in, into your Webpack config. So it may speed up the build a li little bit, but it, uh, more importantly, it improves debug debuggability. 
So uh, maybe you know that this uh, when you're using when you're debugging and you're using async await a lot, and it's really annoying to debug because you see that the browser is actually doing a lot of more behind the scenes, but the source maps only show you the async await functions. So if you don't transpile async await in new browsers, debugging will be a lot more fun. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people still use console.log to do debugging because it's not fun with source maps. So step eight, set up a CSS solution. So this is kind of hard because there are a lot of different solution, but my general advice to you is embrace JavaScript as your CSS preprocessor. It's really nice. You already know JavaScript and uh, now you can leverage that to create your CSS. And this is also known as CSS in JavaScript. Also the term is not really like uh, well defined. So CSS and JavaScript in combination with the mini CSS extract plugin allows us to extract a CSS file per chunk. So we don't get a giant main CSS file. We only get the styles that are necessary for this part of the code. And it also enables tree shaking for styles. So we don't have any unused styles anymore. That's really, really nice. And that's something I really miss in, in old or um, conventional projects. So there are many great CSS in JavaScript solutions, most notably style components and emotion. But most of them come with a runtime cost that users have to pay. And it might be okay for your use case, but personally I don't really like that. So which is, this is why I prefer Treat. Treat is like, it's not really popular right now, but I hope that uh, that you also like it and it's getting more popular. So it's a themable, statical, um, statically extracted CSS in JavaScript uh, with zero or al almost zero runtime. So you get all the benefits, but don't hurt your users. And it looks like this. Uh, we create styles using the style function and um, I import all, all the things, all the style variables or style tokens and uh, to create larger styles. And this works really well if you're already used to atomic uh, CSS to the concept. So we have style tokens and we create uh, more bigger styles like the button style here. And the good thing is if you misspelled something like with the comp uh, TypeScript is going to tell you that this is, this is not correct. We are uh, using TypeScript here. And we'll also give you nice intelligence uh, and suggestions. The setup is straightforward. I'm not going into that. They have a good uh, readme. Um, you can check it out. Step nine, configure bundle optimizations. And I'm not going to into detail here because that would like fill just another talk. Uh, but my general tips are mode production is really, really good enough for most apps. You, instead of like fine tuning a lot, you should use dynamic imports a lot more. For instance, routes, modals, pop-ups, and interactive elements like maps, editors, whatever, should be lazy loaded via import. Really, really do that. Defer all the code that is not immediately necessary. And you can tell that back to prefetch chunks uh, via link well prefetch, and it looks like this is, it is this magic comment you put into the dynamic import, webpack prefetch true, and webpack is going to prefetch the chunk so users don't have to, uh, to actually wait for the chunk. It will load in the background. Tip three, check what you're importing. So this is a nice page, a ni nice website, bundlephobia.com. And uh, I always use it, so if I'm going to use a module, I'm going to enter um, whatever, lodash es, for instance, and it will show you, uh, for instance, if it's tree shakeable, if it's side effect free, it, which means it's going to be like more or better optimizable, and it, you will only use the code that is actually necessary. Check this out. Tip four, don't forget to measure. So if you fine tuning optimization split chunks a lot without measuring it, it makes no sense. You really have to measure it. And you should use user centric performance metrics like time to first meaningful paint. And of course you should use Lighthouse, which is going to tell you if, uh, if your performance is bad. 
Tip five, don't overestimate long-term caching. So the thing is, effective long-term caching of JavaScript assets is really, really hard. And the sad reality is that most JS content hashes will change after every deployment. And this is because it's hard to maintain a constant chunk layout with, uh, across multiple builds. So, yeah. The thing is, but we still don't know how effective long-term caching is in actual real-world applications. So we have to ask, how often are files served from cache? Do we actually know that? For instance, mobile devices tend to purge the cache more often. And the funny thing is there's not a lot of, lot of public research about it. Like, everyone is doing it, and everyone is assuming, well, uh, everything is cached, and that's nice. But is that the reality? Do users actually have the thing in, in the cache? So we need more research about that. And my personal opinion is that long-term caching for fonts, images, and CSS is often just good enough. And these won't change uh, that often. So I think that's it's fine. <laughs> and last tip is that uh, you should minify your CSS. So Webpack only minifies JavaScript by default. So don't forget to minify, also minify your CSS, and you, you can use the optimized CSS assets that pack plugin for that. And the nice thing is treat, like the module I just showed, does this by default, so you don't have to do anything. So my key takeaways are you can use TypeScript in your Webpack config. It helps you. A Webpack config can also be a function where you can pass in the env. Webpack has already good defaults for development and production. You should use that. You should use test for file extensions, include for paths. You should use cache directory true in your Babel loader options to speed up the, the build. Use a browser's list RC. Transpile as less as possible in development. Do less <laughs> to speed up your Webpack build. Um, no type checks, no linting. CSS and JavaScript provides good developer experience and also allows a, a lot of good optimizations. And please don't optimize without measuring. Ship less initial code by using dynamic import. Minify your CSS. And if you don't like to configure that for yourself, there are like uh, good, um, good pre presets. For instance, for React, there's Create React App. Or there is Next.js for server-side rendering. There is Vue CLI that for Vue, which does really, really all the nice things in the background already. There is Nuxt, of course. You can use Angular CLI. There's also Rassel, which uses Webpack under the hood. It's uh, more, uh, it's framework agnostic, so you can use it with any framework. And you can also use Parcel. Do whatever you like. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Thank you.